was completely in. Another soldier came and stood, laid down beside me. And the first thing you know, we were lying in water again. We were just a high point on the beach. And the tide was coming in. <clears throat> he took out back of me and he was shot my leg. The only thing I could do was give him morphine. I had only one left and he received it. I tore part of this shirt and wrapped it around his leg to stop the bleeding. I carried him through again three to four feet of water till I actually reached dry ground. I laid him down and I said, I'm so tired. This is as far as I can go. I threw my arm around him and I, my left arm went up like that and on an instant a mortar or landmine went on. A large piece of shrapnel hit me in the wrist here and went up my arm, paralyzing my left arm. I had no morphine. I had used it on From there, I do not know too much about what happened. I knew that I had to stay awake the best I could. I can remember him climbing up on something and at an instant someone back to this grabbed me by the legs and tossed me on the ground for protection. I was standing there just looking around with shells bursting on me. I was nuts, wasn't I? <laughs> I was nuts, but I didn't realize it. And when I hit the ground, he said, Sergeant, you've got blood coming out of you. Food. I didn't know whether it was blood or salt water. I do not know how long I laid there. It was later in the afternoon that a runner came and said any of us that were wounded and could not serve any longer. As the soldiers was coming in on the boats, if you can make it out across the beach and get in one of those to go back to shore. It was an English boat. I think I was the only one on the beach going back. I don't remember. And I told the English fellow, I said, I'd like to go to the USS Charles Carroll. I had trained on that for over a year at Slackton Sands, and I knew practically everyone on that boat. When they raised me up in the basket, I can remember saying this, let's get the hell out of here. And the captain said, you know, we may have to beach this boat for protection. I think the best, best way things are going. He gave me a shot. And that is all I remember. So I was being carried off the next morning at Southampton to be operated on. That evening I was sent by train to an Edward Island Hospital. I was tagged zone of interior CI. That was back to the United States. I was no more useful to them. I was there for about 30 days, and I had a little rubber ball, and I kept moving that little rubber ball on my left hand, 
and I got strength back into my heart. Maybe I shouldn't have done that and gone back to the city hall. <laughs> but anyway, I was just charged from the hospital. I wanted to go back to my original outfit. Back to Omaha Beach. A major had said, Sergeant, you don't have to go back. You can stay here with me. I said, no, I'm going to go back to my outfit. When I reached my outfit, I knew hardly anyone. They were mostly all gone. And I didn't want to get acquainted with too much of those new fellows, replacements. Because I didn't want to go through the same thing again. Well, I was in four battles, five all together at Omaha. Those of us that were in that battle at Omaha, we had an arrowhead to show that we were in Normandy. And then the other four battle stars that I was in. I ended up at Itzhaker on the Owl River. <coughs> we could not go any further. The Germans were coming. I mean, the Russians were coming in on the other side. Had we gone across, we would have been court martial. I went down to the Owl River one morning. Things were quiet. And all you could see was the German people coming across the American side. And anything that would float, bad floods, dish pans, or whatever, to get away from the Russians. I was there when the war was over. I was transferred my outfit to Bremerhaven, Germany, <coughs> on the North Sea. I had my own service ship. I had everything. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, first I want to tell you, I'll go back a little bit. When we were in a rest area in Germany, we had nothing to do. I dug the biggest foxhole you ever did see. <laughs> then, several days later, our first time when we ever saw her a jet plane fly over and everybody was jumping into my foxhole. <laughs> I couldn't get in. <laughs> and one of the fellows that jumped had cut his hand here. Want to see right she can. I said, I've got to dress this and send you back to the main station. Doc, he said, you sew that up yourself. I put a lot of salt light down in me. Powder, salt and gold light powder on me. I sutured it up and fixed it all up for him. He was happy. And I was happy. But when that war was over, like I said, I was sent up to Grandma Baba to the main station. And who came in but that kid? He said, Doc, I can't move my thumb. <laughs> and I knew what had happened. I'd sutured all the ligaments. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
So I sent him back to the hospital, and I never saw him again. <laughs> he didn't see you either. <laughs> well, things moved along rather fast. I was myself in the not turning the end of the Tony Knight Division, along with a major Buckley on medical division. Were sent to the 69th Infantry Division. As fellows in the 69th, I mean not the 29th, we got a 30 day leave to go back to where we ever wanted to go back. I went to Paris on my way back to London. I came out of the USO show in Paris in the afternoon. And when I got out on the street, everybody was kissing everybody and just jumping up and down and having a wonderful time. I went, what happened? It was the day Japan capitulated. The war in Europe and Japan was in the war. I got back on the way over. But I have to tell you this, though, you'll enjoy it. Maybe some of you remember. I had saved a lot of cartons of cigarettes. I had them in my music bag in the bag. As I was walking up the street in Paris, so I met a Frenchman came up, says, business. We oui, we. Oui. So I followed him up the stairs. I had a 45 in front of him in my belly, nice and hard jacket. And uh, I had a couple of cartons of chewing gum and about seven cartons of uh, cigarettes. I put them out on a table and he pushed the cigarette, uh, pushed the gum away. I put the gum back. Them. I just shot it, get it all, everything up. Well, he bought the cigarettes. He bought the gun. I think I made it worth close to $800. <laughs> 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 I, I am telling you the truth. <laughs> I never made so much money in my life so quick. <laughs> Can't hear you. And we were in service and we went back to the rest area. Soldiers that worked in the rear would come up and say, we'll give you $30 for that watch. It might cost 10 cents. <laughs> what they were doing, they were selling it on the black market, giving $150 to $200, $300 for a watch. Some came back very rich. I could have had, but I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I got to Paris, I caught a train for Southampton. All the way, I stopped to the harbor, and a Frenchman said, business. I said, we, oui, we. Oui. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, so I uh, sold him the uh, English currency. I didn't need it anymore. <laughs> but I made out like a cat bird. <laughs> <laughs> but when I arrived at Turkey, it was similar to a Fort Lauderdale. It was their area that they would go to look for Lauderdale. I picked up the stars and stripes. The 
the 69th Division was murdered for Camp Lucky Strike. That was the staging area for going back to the United States back home. I turned around and I went back right away. When I went back to the 69th, or to the staging area, uh, I got acquainted with a message there, sergeant. <clears throat> By that time, others of the 69th were returning to the staging area. I wasn't put in charge of those coming back, the 29ers. When the 69th came in, I went down and told them that we were all back. And so, they told us that our service records had been sent to an ordinance outfit in Berlin. That didn't go down too good. So I went back to the message center and I told the sergeant, and he said, let's call Shafe headquarters in Paris and see what they have to say. I do not know who the colonel was today. But he said, you fellows in the 29th Division got more points than the whole 69th, and I'm telling you, you're gone home. That was good news to us. Well, you know what happened to me? I was called up to Division headquarters. I had gone over their head, and I, they were going to take my stripes. Well, I said, take them, I don't care, I'm gone home. <laughs> Well, they were told to fly a plane out the next morning to Paris, I mean to Berlin, to pick up our service records. It started to rain. They called me in and said, we're sorry, we can't get a plane off. Well, I was bullheaded. Back to the message center, I went. We called Shape headquarters again, the sergeant did. Got in touch with the same colonel. And he said, I told you fellows you were going home, and I'll tell the division how you are going home. I told the fellows, I said, that's the best news we've had today. It wasn't long till trucks come pulling in loading us and t taking us to the um, quartermaster. <coughs> we had to take off all of our clothes, make out service records the best we could, and get a new issue of booties. That was the climax of my service. I was back on November. Oh, a little bit more noise? <laughs> well, I was back at, uh, in your uh, I was back in November. I was discharged on the 27th of September. September. September on my wife's birthday. <laughs> and I'm telling you, there was a big time in that old gray house that night. <laughs>
And as I looked out on the wall page, well, nevertheless, <coughs> and when I went back to Normandy, after 57 years, and looked again up on the sea, where once the great armada carried troops, including me. I had to go back to Omaha and walk alone upon the shore and let my mind go back in time when there was a war. When I went back, I knew I'd mourn, shed some tears, and feel the pain. I had to go and reminisce and pray and think for those who there remain. For they too were out to sea, and they died at Normandy. And from their graves above the shore, they'll keep their watch all in that sea forevermore. And when I returned from Normandy, where I was with them all once more, I knew that God was with me to remember. sending beautiful rays of color from the shades of leaves that were once filled with light have now scattered and now returned to a normal stage of beauty scattered upon the ground and through the fields. Beauty will fade away as the winter months arrive with rain and snow and what was once will soon pass away leaving only the beauty of memories. It was during the war when we were as thick as the leaves on the trees to show our brilliance and colors of tan and white. Beautiful rays of hope were sent throughout the land. Our stage was set with no idea how long it would last. Our hair was black, tan, and maybe red. And our skin was filled with youth. And as the south wind blew, it started to take its toll. Our lives started to turn like the leaves on the trees before we had a chance to mature. It was taken away upon the battlefields before we could show our full colors of life. The days were short and the months were long. And the years kept fading away. Our hair started to turn as the leaves on the trees from the black to white, as our skin had wrinkled from the weather and not from shame. And upon the battlefield we started to fall like the leaves on an autumn day. And what those lives had done for our country, they would always shine like a rainbow in the sky. And what was once will soon pass away, leaving only memories of the I want you to know I am no hero. All the heroes I left behind. 9,374 buried at Kuhville somewhere. And up on the rock pattern it's called the Spirit of American Youth. And that is how many you see as you look out towards on the whole beach. I do not know for sure, maybe you do know, that all the crosses that show 
where one lies, points west back to this great country of ours. God bless them. And thank you tonight for being here. One, one brief thing I want to mention is if you know servicemen who haven't received the credit due, on his chest he's got the uh, uh, Purple Heart from being wounded. He also has a Bronze Star. The Bronze Star was awarded by Act of Congress in 47 to all the infantry and combat medics that in, went into Omaha Beach or the, into Normandy. They just neglected to tell the soldiers. Marion got his only a few years ago. When we learned at a meeting of the 29th Division that he was eligible for it, we had to write to Congress, go talk to him, our congressmen and stuff like that. So if you know of any, from any war, that have not received the credit that's due to them, let them know and find out and help out. We have one more thing. Ellie wrote this. God bless you. You like it? Yes. Okay. Those are two who run on the boisterous and class can do it. Wow. Are they, are they you? leaving their hopes to a home beyond our country. They carried the burden of the nation that stood silent behind closed eyes, clutching arms under smoke and skies. As waves crashed up on the distant shore, mothers of home cried for boys. Untested man emerged in silent fury, with God Almighty being the judge and jury. Heroes will be born on days like today. Not only God knows what price they will truly pay. Whispering bullets on the way along the line, going out for a soldier who said just a distant time. Mary, thank you very much. Sergeant Mary and Gray, we are truly, truly honored that you are here with us this evening. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs>